Uh, good morning. We're now looking at paper one, which is uh, in not long away. Uh, living with the physical environment. Again, like we said for the human paper, make sure you uh, read the front. Okay, pencil, ruler, calculator. Uh, use black or blue, so we use black. <laughs> uh, black ink, sections A and B, and you do two questions in C. Those are going to be glaciation and coasts. So glaciations and glaciation and coasts. There, look. So for section C, it's glaciation and coasts. You don't do is it rivers because that's right. You haven't done it. Rivers. So don't even attempt it. You might be able to do the first question, and then you'll fall into a a mar of un, not understanding what you're doing. So do um, glaciation coasts. Right, we're going to plow on then section A straight in. Okay, section A, the challenge of natural hazards. We've got a resource. Please make sure you read that resource. Take time to look at it because there's lots of information on it. We've got the scale. We've got uh, a key. Spend time looking at the location of where the different bits are. So earthquakes, other crosses. You've got little triangles for the volcanoes. It's New Zealand. You've got the North Island and the South Island. Then you've got like a plate margin. So here we have plates sliding past each other. Okay, it's like a slipping margin or conservative margin where you get earthquakes, yeah? And here you have plates going into each other, one going under the other. Uh, so continental going under an oceanic, got a bit of land on it, look. And so the continental won't sink, will it? And the oceanic goes under it, and you have like subduction zone, lots of volcanoes and earthquake and lots of destruction and, and um, features like a volcano and earthquake. Okay, a lot of juddering, lots of quakes. Okay, right. Uh, using figure one, name the type of plate margin at Y here so you've got one plate going that way one plate going that way often only one moves generally um, so what would that be called a conservative or passive or transform plate margin I mean they might have said slipping but clearly they want here's our example from the textbook conservative so you, there you go so conservative can slide past one another in opposite directions or in the case that you might have learned with the Sandra, San Andreas fault is two plates sliding alongside one another the same direction but one faster than the other and it's that uh, pressure build-up and slippage that causes the earthquake. Exactly the same type of plate boundary down here in New Zealand, except the plate, uh, sorry, the plates are moving uh, past one another in opposite directions. Okay, for number two, it says using figure one with one of the following statements is true. Shade one circle. So all earthquakes are found along plate on a plate margin. Earthquakes. Uh, well, slightly off it. These are slightly off it, aren't they? They're actually on the actual margin. Mm -hmm. well, that's a little bit dubious, I would say. Um, but generally, earthquakes are found on plate margins. <laughs> but uh, the, that isn't the answer. Okay, they tend these are off it, aren't they? On the North Island, let's see. So clearly, there's lots of uh, destruction at, away from it too when the plates are moving. I guess uh, so. That's not the answer. Earthquakes and volcanoes are evenly spread across New Zealand? No, okay, they're, they're not evenly spread, they're, they're, they're dotted around, okay. Volcanoes and earthquakes only take place on land? No, that's not the case. You've got some in the water, look. Okay, that wouldn't happen anyway, okay. So you get sub subterranean ones, don't you? You get ones in the water. The majority of volcanoes occur in a line to the central part of North Island. Oh yeah, look. That's North Island, and they're in a line. So that's the true one there. Okay, take time to look at this though. There's obviously a couple that are one that's a little bit close to the truth. And then there's one that's really obvious. Look for the one that's really obvious, I think. That's the, that's my advice to you, really. This one is a bit, um, can be a bit confusing as well. So using figure one, how much movement will there be along plate margins said in 100 years? So you go along there, ah, 47 millimetres, bang, you write 47 millimetres. However, it says 100 years, and if you read the key, it says average annual movement. So it's 47 times 100. 47 millimetres times 100 is 4.7 metres. So it's a bit of a sneaky one. Okay, so what we're saying is, please use... Uh, Please read the Look question. Carefully, very read carefully the question and read that. Questions. You know, because these are skills testing you. All easy right? places to pick up, but also easy places to, to drop. To crash marks. and burn. Yeah. Right. Turn over. Right. This one here is again 
uh, asking you to look at figure one and two. So you've got to look at that, and you've got to look at that. And basically it's saying uh, you've got cross-section A to B. So it's probably, um, there it is, across that bit of land. So it's going over this bit here, this plate margin, which is destructive. One plate going into the other one. Mr. Tool, show that one. There's, there you go. That's a destructive plate margin. So you, it's the opposite way around because you've got the land on this side and the ocean on that side on, in our example, in New Zealand. Uh, and basically, you've got to and you've got to talk about it. it. says, suggest why both volcanoes and earthquakes occur in New Zealand. Well, you, you start off by saying, um, we can refer to the figure, you've got a, a conservative margin to the south, you've got a destructive plate margin to the north. Um, so therefore you have two very active margins where you get um, real destruction. Uh, a conservative margin, you get earthquakes, and that's the reason why you get um, lots of earthquakes on the South Island. You can refer to that, actually count how many they've actually been identified there, that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Okay, you can talk about that, but you can also say that you know, up in the north part of the island, it's very much in a, a, a volcanic a zone and an earthquake zone as well. There's lots of seismic activity where you get the subduction of the continental plate um, uh, and the oceanic plate. The oceanic plate getting forced under the continental plate, getting subducted. It's denser, it's denser so it and sinks heavier. and heavier, so it sinks. Uh, consequently, it goes into the magma. Lots of explosion, the oceanic crust melts, and that, and then the friction of the plate juddering down into the subduction zone. So the oceanic plate, which is the, this one here, the Pacific plate, yeah, going into the Indo-Australian plate. Um, so the oceanic plate goes into the, the subduction zone, melts, explosions, and you've got uh, lots of destruction. You've got volcanoes and you've got earthquakes. The one thing I may add to that is just saying that what this question is asking you to do is describe what's happening in these two plate boundaries, the destructive and the conservative. Uh, and if you wanted to add something there, you could say that this is all driven by the process of convection currents in the Earth's mantle. So the heat within the Earth's mantle driving the movement of the crust on the surface. Okay. So in essence, it's asking you to describe and explain conservative and destructive plate margins. What's the cause of it and what happens? The so causes and uh, and what happens, basically. So it's it's basically that bit there in your notes, which is that bit there, Mr. Trill, isn't it? But then referring to the figure as well to support it. Um, I think that's... And suggest, the word command word suggest, it, so responses should set out the likely causes of volcanoes and earthquakes from the sources provided, show an understanding of the processes involved. The question requires an analysis of the sources as well as understanding of tectonic processes. It's that same old piece of advice, use the resource, quote the resource. So it's really in essence saying uh, describe and explain the causes of conservative and destructive plate margins using the resource. That's what it's asking you to do, which you can do straightforward. Right, next one. This looks like uh, study figure three, a graph showing the area of Arctic sea ice each September between 1979 and 2000. So we've moved straight from tectonic hazards to uh, weather hazards or climatic hazards. Uh, yeah, so we have like a change in uh, the temperature, really We're losing ice, aren't we, from 1980 to 2015, really. It's like a, a general pattern of decline. So fig using figure three... It asks you to describe how the Arctic ice has changed. So you, what I would say is uh, there's been an overall decrease in extent of Arctic ice, yeah, sea ice. see that on the curve. Uh, the changes in Arctic sea ice Quite have fluctuated numbers. considerably. It's gone up and down, although it's dropped off. Uh, there was limited change from 1979 to 1996. It was quite so steady. 79 to 96 of this area. Followed by a rapid decrease, 1996 onwards. And you can actually say how many million squares as well. So credit use of data shown on graph or for data manipulation. For example, a decrease in extent from 8 million to 4 million at its lowest point. What we don't want is the classic mistake is to try and tell us why. We don't want to know that. It's just telling us to describe the graph. Describe the graph. A loss of almost 50%, you can say that if you wanted to, in 36 years. A decrease from 7.2 million square kilometres to 4.8 million square kilometres between 1979 and 2016. 
considerable fluctuations, uh, no credit for stating there's been a steady or consistent decrease. You've got to say more than that. So talk about the tra trend of change and then refer to numbers, which you've said lots of times. All right? Okay. And then you can't say all of that because it's only two marks, but... And then we get into the why. Yeah, now it's like, give two ways that human activity may have contributed to the changes. So we start, what are the causes of global warming, basically? Or a greenhouse effect, the enhanced greenhouse effect, basically? Uh, so burning of fossil fuels, uh, rapid manufacture of products. So you've got lots of burning of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, rapid rates of deforestation. So burning the trees, clearing away the trees, and the trees don't suck up the carbon dioxide anymore. Uh, increased methane emission from agricultural mining. Uh, that's another one. Uh, farming, increased agriculture, for, you know, growth. Like rice growing, isn't it? Rice, rice paddies, growing, yeah. cattle farming. Too much methane going into the sky, which is a car carbon gas. Greater uh, carbon emissions from transport using oil and gas, burning of fossil fuels. There are loads of them. Easy. Easy. That's an easy answer. Right. Next one is explain why. Explain why. Explain how. So explain how volcanic activity and orbital changes may cause long-term climate change um so that's quite a complex question in itself i mean you you might want to talk about the Lankovic cycle um with our so if we if, if we started with volcanic activity the idea being is that that's a bit easier to talk about as yeah. well isn't it so you talk about the volcanic winter yeah so with with volcanic activity if you get particularly uh, strong eruptions that put lots of volcanic ash up into the atmosphere they block out the sun's uh, UV energy and you can actually have global uh, decrease in temperatures. So climate change, remember, can be temperatures going up as well as temperatures going down. So uh, what you've got with the volcanic eruption is the sulfuric acid, uh, sorry, the sulfuric di sulfur dioxide, get it right, uh, acts like tiny mirrors and reflects the sun's energy and therefore you get global cooling. Uh, that's a shorter term uh, atmospheric change. Now, the question also asks you to look at orbital changes. So that, as Mr. White said, that is your Milankovitch cycle uh, that is um, to do with the, the passage of the, the Earth around the sun. Uh, so you probably remember this sort of diagram. Uh, and the orbital change for, that Milankovitch identified was, uh, he called it eccentricity. Uh, and basically what's happening is the Earth's uh, path around the sun is not fixed. On about a hundred thousand year cycle, uh, it can get closer to and further away. So the eccentricity, the the path around the sun becomes more elliptical or more oval shape at certain times, and a bit more egg shaped at other times. So, and that movement closer and further away from the sun also causes climate change. But that's on a much bigger um, time span, uh, every sort of hundred thousand years, and there's evidence to suggest that links up to. Uh, warmer periods, uh, interglacial, uh, as well as cooler periods and, and glacial or ice ages. Okay, if you explain those, four marks there. Right, next. Study figure four, a satellite image of a hurricane, Matthew, that's a good name, shortly before it crossed, <laughs> it crossed Haiti in October 2016. So we've got like the eye of the storm, which is X. Uh, and then you've got uh, Haiti, so Haiti's going to get hammered by that. Haiti's under there that somewhere. That tropical storm, yeah, not good. Um, so using figure four and your own understanding, complete the following sentences. So figure four shows that the pattern of winds moving around the centre was anti-clockwise uh, because... You so you that? can see in this diagram, you can clearly see... So we know, don't we, that in a depression in the northern hemisphere... A low pressure system moves anti-clockwise, but it's this. You can see this sort of spiraling pattern. So uh, it's uh, because the clouds show an anti-clockwise pattern. The cloud spirals inwards, or um, because of the way the clouds are arranged. So is this is this kind of corkscrewing idea? We yeah. Know, and at X, storm. the eye of the hurricane, the weather conditions were likely to be calm, mostly clear skies, very little rain or no rain. Low wind speeds there. So the one part of the hurricane where it's the calmest is the eye at the centre. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, good. Right. Next one, Mr Tyrrell. Okay, so, study figure five. What's this showing us? This is showing us lots of A buildings photograph. that have been uh, blown apart by Hurricane Matthew. Photograph, uh, looks like lots of the buildings, roofs have been blown off, buildings have been blown over or knocked down in the storm. 
Uh, obviously, you'd have a colour version in the exam, so it'd be a bit clearer. So the question saying, use the figure five and state two primary effects of Hurricane Matthew. Oh, I think I just did. Yeah, so you got what? So you got buildings, buildings again. down. I'd imagine as well. There's probably people been killed in those building collapses as well. You got homelessness. Uh, communications down. Electricity cables blown up. Uh, roads blocked. Um, what else any two. Any two. Any of those sort of things, couldn't you? Um, right now, our nine marker with spag. Buildings like to collapse. Right, this is the big one. Using a named example. Evaluate the immediate and long-term responses to tropical storms. Now, I'm just talking to this Miss Till then. Uh, make sure you get your spelling and punctuation and grammar right. That's for the three markers. That's important. But let's just not worry about the word evaluate for the minute because sometimes that's what throws lots of students. It's just a simple question. Talk about a case study. Typhoon I am. You put the case book, okay? And all you've got to do is talk about the immediate responses and the long-term responses. So you learn them and you churn them out, okay? Like a question that could be about primary and secondary effects. So you, so you learn that, churn that out, okay? The evaluate bit is really, I mean, you've got to show some sort of like um, uh, explanation at the end, maybe in a conclusion or during when you're writing, when you're saying this is probably more important than this one. Um, you can argue basically all of those responses on the media and short, and long term and short term are all important. Um, but the long-term responses, you could argue, are better because they get the country back on their feet at the end of the day so that they can recover in the long term. So you're helping agency of organisations, helping people to re-establish their sort of farming techniques, um, establishing building of homes, uh, starting to improve their fishing boats again so that they can actually fish for the future. But then you could also argue, hang on a minute, what about the immediate effects? People are dying and in dire straits and there's real stress across the whole um, area. Immediate evacuation and food and, you know, reduces the death toll as well. So you could argue both are, imp are important and which one isn't. So, but by in effect doing that, you're doing the evaluation anyway. All right. So you've, by doing that, you have. OK, so don't overthink it. And then in conclusion, you could argue a point saying, oh, I think the long-term responses are important because that gets the country back on their feet uh, in the future. And, you know, we've got to support them to help themselves and also learn about how to respond in the future when another one arrives, because uh, it will, because it's geographically going to be, it's in that pathway, isn't it? Anything else, Mr. Terrell? Yeah, the only thing I might add is quite often in the rebuilding process, so in the longer term effects, sometimes people can be unhappy with uh, the location of rebuilding uh, or the style of rebuilding because often it's done, um, uh, when we say long term, it can be years, but often there's emergency rebuilding. Uh, it's, it's, it can upset people, it can be away from their original homes uh, and therefore it can be less effective because it has social impact on people. But that would be the only place where I'd evaluate. We did look at the um, question uh, where, it, where it's asking you to evaluate. You can get uh, up to six marks by talking about the immediate and long-term responses. If you start saying how good they are, you can guarantee yourself six. And then for the seven, eight, and ninth mark, it's then about how well you evaluate. Okay? Then get your spag right.